because I know what lies at the end of the journey. An amusing tale is told about the arrival of the Arabs in Samarkand. I find it amusing, anyway. There were three Arab missionaries who stopped here and decided to let Allah decide their fate by cutting up and boiling a large sheep. The first missionary reaches into the pot and he pulls out the sheep's heart and he knows that he must return to Mecca, the heart of Islam. The second missionary, he reaches in and pulls out the sheep's head and he knows he has to stay here in Samarkand. The third missionary, he reaches in and he pulls out the sheep's arse and he knows that he must leave immediately for Baghdad, which he does. But me, I'm staying here, Samarkand. Now, there's a name to conjure with. The mirror of the world, they called it. The pearl of the east, the jewel of Islam. But then they also call it the city of famous shadows. And that's because it's haunted by so many ghosts. Samarkand's an oasis on the edge of the Kizil Kum desert. The trouble with being an oasis is that everybody wants your water and they all know where you are. This programme's too short for me to list all the conquerors and warriors and nomadic cutthroats who'd loomed out of the desert to take Samarkand. Alexander the Great, Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, they've all had it. Scythians, Sogdians, White Huns, Black Huns, Arabs, Ghaznavids, Mongols, Bolsheviks. This was everyone's favourite oasis, but only Tamerlane held on to Samarkand for long enough to transform it. Tamerlane was a Mongol who'd been Turkicized and converted to Islam. He claimed some sort of descent from Genghis Khan, but you'd expect that. Around here, all the ruthless warrior conquerors claimed descent from the great Khan. His real name was Timur, a common name, which means iron. And Tamerlane is an English corruption of Timur the Lame. He had a disfigured leg from an old archery wound. Tamerlane was a genius at his trade, the ruthless and conscience-free conquest of anywhere he could reach. He personally conquered an empire that stretched from Moscow to Delhi, from modern Turkey to the outer edges of Russia. But when it came to choosing a capital, Tamerlane picked somewhere just around the corner from where he was born, Samarkand, this fabulous crossroads on the Silk Route, which Timur the Lame transformed into this architectural gem in the desert. Timur the Lame is one of the few mortals who's given his name to a style of architecture. And this Timurid architecture is one of the glories of Islam. The city of domes is another of Samarkand's names. They glitter here on every horizon and give Samarkand a permanent shimmer as if the mirage can never settle. Domes have always had an obvious relationship with the heavens. People used to think of the sky itself as a giant dome covering the earth. And Timurid architecture makes this connection entirely explicit. The buildings, the lower halves, are fashioned out of these desert bricks, so brown and earthy like the ground around here. 
and then rising above them are these celestial domes, usually coloured an evocative turquoise. The Timurids specialised in this blue. Their architecture is excellently colour-coded for instant legibility. The domes are blue, the buildings are brown, the message on the walls could hardly be bigger or clearer or more insistent. Out here in the desert, on the edges of the empire, in the middle of nowhere, you need to spell it out. The word minaret is derived from the Arabic word minara, which means lighthouse. Originally, these Timurid minarets were intended to be literally lighthouses in the desert. You have to imagine them rising like steeples in this hot and flat land, visible from all angles. And thirsty camel traders trudging along the silk route, seeing one of these in the distance and knowing that here they would find water and hope and God. Allah, 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 it says on this one. Mohammed, Mohammed, Mohammed. It's a brilliant piece of religious advertising, perfectly positioned in the desert to bring in the client. So the dusty Silk Road trader is lured to this gorgeous oasis by the lighthouses. The domes tempt him closer, and he finds himself in here, a perfect garden, in which a million flowers seem to be blossoming at once. So colourful, so intense. A paradise in the desert, created artificially with the slow flicker of timurid tile work. Can you hear the water tinkling? Can you feel the shade beckoning? Who wouldn't choose a religion that promises this? I was looking forward to coming here. Shah i Zindar, reputed to be Samarkand's most moving architectural site. It's a Timurid necropolis, a street of the dead in which Tamerlane buried his female relations. They say the earliest examples of Timurid architecture are found in here, or at least they used to be because look what they're doing to them. This is a UNESCO site, an official world treasure. But in Uzbekistan today, not nearly enough respect is shown for the great Islamic art of the past. As far as I can see, Shari Zindar is being vandalized. This isn't restoration, it's ruination. They're determined to complete this by Uzbekistan's Independence Day, which is coming up. This is their idea of working quickly to finish the job. It's like a construction site at a very ugly shopping centre. Look at this brickwork. Oh, look what they've done to the tiles. There are men up there hacking away at irreplaceable 15th century Timurid domes with four inch chisels and 10 pound mallets, and occasionally leaving precious fragments of original tile work behind. If you like buildings and you like Timurid architecture, which everyone in their right minds should, because it's one of the most inventive and unmistakable architectural traditions in our civilization. And don't come here. You'll just want to cry. Mm -hmm.